Um, just before I start, there is, I think, there is a typo in this piece. Um, it hasn't been picked up yet um, by Trinity, um, so hopefully soon it will be. And um, it is in bar six, seven, eight, bar eight, um, the start of the new section. We've got an E on that pickup bar, uh, but it's a D sharp, um, definitely. I mean, the melody. If you listen to lots of guitar players play this arrangement by um, David Russell, um, you'll hear them all play D-sharp. It should be a D-sharp. I played it as an E just because I always try and bring you the grade piece as the examiner will see it in the grade. Um, so, I mean, I will, if, if they change it to D-sharp, I will let you know, kind of, I'll, I'll put a, a comment in the description saying, Okay, you can play a D sharp now, but for the time being, for the grade, play an E there instead of a D sharp, which is what it should be. Um, on that note as well, um, most versions of this song that I hear, not the guitar arrangement, but most versions of this song in bar, six, seven, eight, so bar nine, um, this chord at the end, um, it's normally an E7 chord, not an E major 7 chord. Um, and this again might be a typo, but I, I, I hear a lot of guitarists playing this D sharp, and I feel like it should be a D natural. That would explain why it's got second finger on that second, on, on the D. I mean, you wouldn't play that D sharp with the second finger at all. Um, I see that um, Zufa Yang has uh, played this and, and has played that as D natural. I can't, uh, I don't know about any other guitarists playing this arrangement. Um, it makes more sense harmonically, in my opinion, uh, because we've got this kind of shift temporarily to A major, like uh, on in bar six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, and the best way to get to A major is via a dominant seventh chord on the fifth, so the, the dominant seventh chord. So. If the, the fifth of A major is E, which with the, and this is the key of the piece, E major, but it, with this um, quick change to A major, um, it makes far more sense to play a dominant seventh chord with a D natural, which is outside of the key, um, than a D sharp. I mean, have a listen to that. that there's the D sharp. Sounds okay, but it, it harmonically. Uh, fall into the C sharp in the next bar. Um, it makes more sense. Obviously, again, for the grade, play it as a D sharp. Um, 
and maybe it is. Maybe it's meant to be. Uh, it's not unheard of for a, an E major seven chord to go to A major. Um, but when I hear versions of this played by kind of folk musicians, um, there's actually there's a really nice uh, uh, performance by Alastair MacDonald um, that I got on Spotify, and you can hear the dominant seventh in that. So there are two things to to think about with the piece there. Um, yeah, and in that in that recording by Alastair MacDonald, he explains that. There is this Celtic belief um, that someone who dies in a foreign land, um, their spirit returns to Scotland via the low road. Um, and in then goes on to say that in 1745, two Scottish soldiers were captured, um, I think in Carlisle, and one was executed and one was set free. Um, so they both returned to Scotland, one dead as a spirit via the low road and one set free um, still living via the high road and obviously the spirit got to Scotland before the man who was still alive. It's a nice, um, a kind of nice story. <laughs> um, all these old kind of folk songs tend to have some uh, deep dark meaning to them. Um, yeah, it's a really lovely tune. So bear that in mind. Uh, uh, this this goes on to my the next big point, which is um, this is a, a this is a song. There are lyrics. We should always be aware of the lyrics and hearing them in our head. I mean, it says lento recitativo, so you know this recitative idea is that the the melody and the words are really important and, and the act of the melody is shaped by the way we kind of deliver the words. And of course, we have no words um, in this instrumental arrangement. It's why I, I kind of have a weird love of um, song arrangements for guitar or for any kind of instrument because it's missing. It's like it's missing a, a leg. We're missing really the most important part of a song. Um, and we as musicians often forget that. I'm always kind of melodically driven rather than lyrically driven because I'm a musician at heart. I'm not a poet or a writer. Um, and yeah, it's great. We're, we're playing this beautiful piece, but it is missing a part of its soul. There's no words. And we have to, we, we have to be aware of the words as a performer, even though we're not going to give them to the audience because the audience might be aware of the words and the words have um, more meaning than the music. You know that a song is a song really isn't isn't whole at all without the words. Um, so, like, yeah, find the lyrics online. I'll put them in the description below. Um, what's nice is that we we can feel how the melody is shaped and what the melody is in this, and that's important that we project the melody above everything else. If we can pin words to the melody, that's even better. It is can it brings on a never uh, another level of authenticity and it um, if we hear words in our head as we're playing that is conveyed to the audience something is given to the audience um, we need to think about these kind of things so the melody. <laughs> What's quite important there, I think, is that the if you take um, you'll take the high road and I'll take the low road. road and the, this is interesting because really the the phrase ends not on low. We might play this kind of. But it's not. It's 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 more. Uh, so the 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 phrasing is maybe not what we'd expect. And again, that's that's one of the examples of how knowing and and, and listening to the lyrics can help us understand phrasing and how we can shape the line and the notes. 
Um, and I like that. I, I, I love this. So really that C sharp in bar two, it's almost got an accent on it. Um, and it has to ring obviously over the chord. comes in later again. Um, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll keep it at the beginning, beginning and then um, explain more about the melody as we go on. Um, so, yes, the, in the first bar I think it's important to remember um, that this is 50 BPM for a recitative. It's it. So, there is definitely an, a, a, a you know a liberal amount of rubato we can add to this, in honour of the words to to help the words, and the phrasing of the melody come across. Um, so I wouldn't really play this with a metronome too much, um, except to get a feel for the, the the kind of rough tempo and the and the tempo jump that needs to happen in, um, later on. <laughs> Always project this melody above everything else. Um, I like to highlight sometimes in my student scores the, the melody and where it is so that we can know when it needs to ring on, we can know which notes aren't melody that we should tuck safely underneath, you know, in terms of the volume and the balance. Uh, I think that can really help. So bar one, I'm playing this double E with the thumb. Um, I do this a few times in this piece, I think. I use the thumb to kind of fan through. It's an acquired taste. Some people don't like doing that. Um, I, I guess what I like about it is that it does, it enables us to separate uh, and, and draw attention to the melody note. You know, it's a bit of a silly comment to make, but like if violin with double stops does that all the time, I mean, it, it can't be this terrible sin to, to do that. Um, you don't have to, but what I like to is that, you know, my thumb is, is strong, you know, big fat false nail on it. I can really give that some welly and I couldn't give that as much welly if I was playing it with the index finger on the melody and the thumb on the sixth string. Um, so I like it, as long as I don't overdo it. If I do it on every single chord and spread it, then it's too much. Um, so consider doing that note with a thumb. And, uh, what, what I like too is that you know you push, you, you kind of, it's a soft sixth string and then a, uh, a full fifth string. The first two notes of the piece I'm playing, rest stroke, that's another thing to think of with this. We can employ rest stroke on the melody to bring it out at certain points. Um, for instance, I, uh, in, the, in, the, in the first full bar, um, I, after the chord, which I'm playing with IMA, by the way, just to kind of tuck it in the background, I think the balance is nice with IMA rather than with thumb taking the lower note where it might suddenly um, be a bit too loud. After that, free stroke, free stroke, rest stroke um, to give that note some longevity. And then again I think free stroke, free stroke, rest stroke. double thumb thing in bar two. Make sure your barre here extends over four strings at the start, obviously, to get the E. Um, and here's another thing about this piece that happens occasionally. The chords, are, you know, say to ring on for a dotted crotch at most of the time. Um, 
and obviously the, the fingering in this bar directly contradicts that. We can't keep those two notes on the E and the A and play the melody notes. Um, there, are, there are a few things you could do if you really wanted those notes to ring on. Um, you know, we can kind of sacrifice one of them and have the A ring on, blah, blah, blah. blah. I just think this, the chord is not important, the B will ring on, the melody is important here. Um, so we don't need to hold on that chord. <laughs> to cut a long story short, that C sharp, especially if we give it a bit of a push and accent. It, it doesn't matter. So don't feel like you have to kind of pull some feet of extreme athletics and um, kind of twist and contort your fingers to get this to stay on whilst you play bass notes. You don't have to. Bar three. I think also uh, bar three um, highlights this idea of trying not to let the string squeaks happen too much in this piece. Um, again, I I, I some like I think some guitarists really try their best not to have any string sweets whatsoever, and that's admirable and great. Um, I don't think it matters to that extent. I think the odd string squeak um, is fine, um, but but I do try and limit it in this piece. So in bar three, going from the E to the D sharp, I don't just slide and keep the pressure on. I am. Um, I take it off at the last split second in a very controlled way to ensure that there's no string squeak or as little as possible. And then again there. So we sacrifice the, the tiniest split second of smoothness of legato to take the note off, avoid your string squeak. Avoiding string squeaks like this on the bass strings when we've got a, a really powerful melody is really, really tricky. Um, and I think it should only be considered at grade seven level after you've got everything else really, really nice and tight. I don't think you should um, do that and avoid the string squeaks at the, uh, at the sacrifice of something else. So once you feel like the piece is as good as you can get it, you could then experiment a little bit with nice uh, quiet sound with no strings squeaking. Um, so I'll, I'll go through the rest of the piece and, and alert you to any points where that will happen again. I'm playing that C sharp and E with my P and I. See I'm not doing um, uh, double thumb always. M and A on the B and E strings. A nice uh, stealthy jump up to sixth fret for the G sharp. Um, obviously, David Russell. If you don't know him, he's, he's one of the kind of great guitarists of this generation. Um, phenomenal player, and it, it's so nice to get an arrangement um, arrangements by players um, like him because he knows the guitar. <laughs> incredibly well and knows that that melody will be really sweet on the full string so it is um, I always feel quite safe with an arrangement by a guitarist who's just one of the best um, out there because you know that it's well considered and well thought out <laughs> um, so bar four nice C sharp we, we do have to be careful of this note not to make it sharp. It's easy to... I mean, I think I'm going a bit sharp occasionally on that note. It's very hard to avoid. So don't, don't um, squeeze it, don't pull it, don't get it out of, out of alignment. Um, and, and above all, we've got to be hearing that that C sharp is prominent and the B is prominent. So I'm playing that P I M A. P, yep. And the A, I'm kind of angling the hand a bit so that the A finger has a real good trajectory, a real good um, angle to play loud. You really want to hear 
hear that B above everything else. So you've got that chord on, you've done that. Now we need to get the fourth finger to take those two notes. And I was, uh, you know, I was toying with the idea of barring them or doing some sort of roll of the finger. Those notes are soft, they're not important. So just, they, they don't have to be legato, you know. Bar. You can do that, that's fine, as we change between them. So, as long as that chord is nice and powerful and the B is projected, it doesn't matter about the rest of it. Keep it quiet, jump the fourth finger around. It's really, really a, a challenging uh, shape, that. Um, bar five, another rest stroke. There, a bit of a right if you can. has to be a bit more kind of in like this I find I'm changing it to get that fourth finger enough clearance to not block off the second string and then here we've got to kind of balance the melody at the end of the bar G sharp open B so we've got two very different sounding strings here carrying a melody that should sound quite kind of similar throughout. So G sharp B. Um, so, you know, work on really making that B as rounded and full sounding as the fourth string G sharp. And then into the next chord. Thumb takes that A, which is the most important note there. So bar six. Um, this is another place where you could look at stopping the the string from squeaking the full string. Um, I just I feel like there we lose. It's really hard to do that and keep the legato and the uh, nature of the melody, the smooth sound. So I don't, I, I let that um, slide sound happen. Um, I guess the tip is if you're playing this piece for a grade, don't use super new strings, because then if you use super new strings, they'll be really, really loud. Um, so these are a few, few days old, these strings, a week or two. Um, and I'm not playing that chord there as double thumb I don't think um, again with the, the chord here the A and the B uh, we could keep that chord on but by, by using the third finger on the B and first finger on the D sharp. It's up to you. I think if you do that, it's then very hard to not get another string squeak as we move the fingers. Um, again, I don't. It's not necessary that that if if you take your finger off the A and put it on that B. Still have the B ringing on there. Um, I think another thing, an important thing here, looking at the next bar, bar seven, is that even though the bass notes tend to be a crotchet, um, I let a lot of them ring on. So I think I let that G sharp ring on until I shift it to the B and let the A ring on. I think it could sound a bit um, robotic if we mute the fifth string, or mute these after a crotchet. So same in bar one. Are we, gonna, are we really gonna mute that E in the bass on the second beat of the bar? There? Sense to me. Um, 
the same with the A. We're going to mute that in bar two. There. I don't think so. So a lot of these bass notes can ring on. Okay, yeah, bar eight, very hard. Um, I think on coming into bar eight, I kind of get my fingers ready, my hand ready. We need to rotate the arm around to get the fourth finger onto the sixth string. That's a very hard shape to hold and not block off any strings. So, feel, see that coming, get ready. Um, I think I'd take the, the barry off on the G sharp before the new bar, just to give myself some time to change. Again, it, we cut that chord short by a quaver, doesn't matter. There's a good loop. See already on the G sharp, I've moved my hand, get, getting it ready. And there we go. Um, I've talked about this this typo there already uh, in Liana Bar Eight. Um, Poco Piamoso, so slightly faster. Um, you know, it kind of pushes ahead. I almost interpret this. Poco Piamoso is like if the if the first section is um, a bit more rubato with you know you, you kind of using the melody to pause and and slow down time, then here it's a bit more like here's a regular beat. And I talked about this chord as well. So n nothing to say there. Uh, probably this is more full, this section, I, I feel. And of course the melody is now in the, uh, in, uh, on the, uh, in the treble. So lots of nice A, uh, you know, strong A finger plucking the uh, melody. Find that stretch in bar ten nasty, which it is. You could always take you could take those two things off actually. Um, even go as far as to say as you could sacrifice the bass note and use two on the A, four on the D sharp. It's fine. There's more places where I'm lifting the second finger rather than sliding to avoid squeaks. Nice spread chord there. Get bigger, get ready. If you can, do any vibrato on that C sharp. It's lovely. And obviously we need to do that as a barre. Um, over four strings and then collapse it to a full barry. Um, give yourself a bit of breath there. You can kind of pause slightly to get the change to work. And I like this diminuendo. I wouldn't have done it. I would have kept crescendoing here. Play that loud, but it's nice to come back. Um, My fingering here is different to what's written down. I play in bar 13, 3, 4 on the melody, and then 3, 2, uh, and then put the bar down. So B is played under the bar. That bar shifts down and extends into bar 
Oh, 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 into the next bit. So, I just preferred that to what they did with changing the fingers round. Um, really, really lovely chord voice in there. And, and gorgeous inner, inner line writing. Um, so we got this, this, this G sharp to A, G sharp, F sharp, B. Really nice inner line to, to be aware of. Um, Bar, bar 14. I do take the barre off and cut that A on the third string a bit short um, to do the barre over six strings. It's especially okay there because we've got an A ring on in the bass. Um, so to have that A ring on as well, it's not necessary. But I would do that. E fretted, I play that on the second string. Yeah. Another nasty jump. That fourth finger has to really work for that. Um, again, find, find an arm orientation to help bring that fourth finger into play. Really nice here. Right if you can. Here we, we run into this problem of balance because the melody goes from the B to the G sharp. So, um, uh, sorry, yeah. It's very easy for it to sound like B to E because the E string is. Uh, where you think the melody might need to carry on to. It's very hard to get the bounce right, that's what I'm saying there. So, um, uh, we need to kind of really hear that melody and try and bring that out. One thing that might help there is to play A, M, M, I. Just shake the fingers up a little bit so that the A takes the melody note here, the B, and then the I finger takes the G sharp. Basically, you, you just you don't want this. Um, where the E rings louder than the melody note. Um, yeah, cool. And then it's a repeat. You can vary that. I think I've played this a few times where I played the the repeat of this section nice and even more rubato and, and quiet and I quite like it um, but it does tend to drag so the other thing I did I think for this performance is try and push it out a little bit triumphantly and then it kind of it really comes down at the end um, so it's definitely a, a fretting hand roast this piece lots of um, awkward shapes and that thing with a slow piece where you know if you mess up the fingering on a fast piece the note buzzes it's gone over in a split second you can move on it doesn't matter here if you screw up a note you, 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 you know it's there it sticks out terribly so it's really about especially with the melody it's got to be so on <laughs> Can't let it buzz or, or come off or sound dodgy because, um, yeah, then it would really sound bad. Um, so to wrap up, um, melody always above the rest of it. Really, really think about that melody line. Examine the lyrics. Listen to some versions of this that aren't just guitar. Um, uh, so you can kind of hear 
uh, kind of folky Scottish sound and the words um, yeah that's it really um, I hope you have got something from this um, and just to let you know I am doing online lessons I'm doing one-on-one -on -one zoom lessons I have a few slots available at the time of doing this video at the end of 2020 um, I'm also doing video responses where you can record yourself and send the recording to me and I will send a recording uh, back to you kind of giving you comments and suggestions and exercises and PDF kind of sheets of things you can work on. Um, so let me know if you're interested. Contact me in the description below and enjoy the piece.